So we'll start with a word of prayer. Lord God, thank you for your kindness and goodness towards us, Lord. You are so good to us, O oh Lord. And uh, your word is, Lord, help us to look into it and to understand it. We ask this in your son's name, Jesus Christ, for beside you there is no God. Amen. Amen. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Now, let me read you this from Galatians. Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid and the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh. But he of the free woman was by promise. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. But I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to the whole, the whole law. And, there's, and this applies to the fact that there's people out there, and this is what we see with, with the Jewish people, they, um, they win the route of the law, and that can get you into bondage. And that's what this is talking about. And of course, there's people, like we said, and that can happen to us. We can get into the point where we think we're going to keep ourselves safe. We're going to keep ourselves living good lives, victorious lives. And that's what that's, we saw that at the uh, Rephidim. God says, you're being carried. It is you, I'm carrying you. Um, so he gets all the glory. Now this is what, we left off this uh, last week. Last week, There shall not an hand touch it, but he shall surely be stoned or shot through. Whether it be beast or man, it shall not live. When the trumpet soundeth, soundeth long, they shall come up to the mount. So the Lord's talking to Moses. Uh, and notice this, there shall not in hand touch it. And these people had all these holy things, all these pictures that God gave them, the, uh, the brazen altar, the table of showbread, the uh, Ark of the Covenant, the uh, altar of incense. But notice you couldn't touch them. All these beautiful uh, things that were made out of wood and, and uh, uh, overlaid with gold, you couldn't touch them. That's a picture of the Lord says there was so much work to be done and they could, with their law, it was a rituals thing. They couldn't touch it. They had, all of them had poles. So they were going to be getting into a rituals. This is what it is. And you see religions um, that are attempting, attempting to get to God, it becomes uh, ritualistic. That's what it is. And so the, here's, you have the Jewish people doing this. And Moses went down from the mount unto the people and sanctified the people, and they washed their clothes. And he said unto the people, Be ready against the third day, come not at your wives. So Moses comes down from the mount unto the people and sanctified the people, and they washed their clothes. Now notice here, they washed their clothes. Through the idea of assuming the shape of the object beneath uh, the clothes, that's what the clothes are. You know, when you put on a garment, it, it, it conforms to your body. And so it's an outer. It's an outer thing. And so that's what the law is. Because you can look pretty good to other people on the outside. But the Bible says he looks on the heart. So the Jewish people wind up doing that. They wind up taking care of the outside. And that's what the Lord called them. Why did sepulchers? You know, because they look good on the outside because that's what the law takes care of that. Yeah, you can fool people some of the time. That's what they say, you know. <laughs> and that little, um, and also and notice, uh, sanctify the people and they wash their clothes. And again, that word wash is to trample with feet. I guess that was a way of washing, making them a fool, um, cleansing them. And that little, that little comment at the end, and come not at your wives, there's, I, I put some verses there for your own, but it has got to do with something. The Jewish people, and the law said that concerning, uh, it deals with concerning uncleanness, 
or losing strength, but I'll leave that up to you. Nonetheless, in fact, the Catholic Church, I had, I had heard people before through Catholicism that they believe that, that is, um, that's where the original sin comes from, and of course they're wrong. Because the Bible says in Hebrews uh, thirteen four that the bed is undefiled and and God has blessed. There's nothing wrong with that. But the law can do things like that, make it ritualistic. Ritualistic. Uh, and it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud, so that the people that was in the camp trembled. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the nether part of the mount. So again, we looked at the, at that, at the third day. That's a picture of uh, there's a day coming when God is going to put hook that uh, olive branch back into the olive tree. We're the, olive, the wild olive branch, but they're the true branch. That's the third day. There's a day coming. So we saw that. And notice here how a thick cloud upon the mount, God is going to descend upon that mountain, and yet they're not going to be able to see him. You can't. The law will not allow that. And so there's a thick cloud, and not only can you not touch it, you're going to be able to hear only. And that's what happens with the law. It, it really holds you back. And we can see it in this throughout this story. Uh, the cloud is, uh, is going to keep them from seeing it. And the voice of a trumpet exceeding loud so that all the people that was in the camp tremble. And God is making them afraid on, on purpose. You know, um, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That's what the Bible says. And when you fear the Lord, I often think of one time my mom took me to a, to a wedding because she was serving at the wedding. And uh, she told me I had on a blue suit. I think the only one I ever had, I think, because uh, it got to the point where it was really high water, you know. Uh, but she said, just sit there and don't go anywhere. And so she went over there and she, she was serving our rice. And, and, and these two boys come over there and say, hey, Phil, let's go do this. And I thought, yeah. And I looked at her and she just kind of looked at me. And I says, no, I'll stay here. You know? <laughs> <laughs> the fear of the mom is the beginning of wisdom, you know. Oh, yeah. I knew it because she kept the word. She says, uh, we'll have a board meeting when we get home, you know. <laughs> so I obeyed. You know, she kept her word. That's the thing. And so here the Lord is bringing something. He's bringing him. This, this is a picture of his holiness. And to approach his holiness, who can do that? And so he's putting all kinds of restrictions through the law. It's very difficult to get there. In fact, impossible. So Moses brought forth the people to meet with God. Here is a, he's been a mediator, and we know that there's only one, and that's Jesus, but they're using Moses. And notice this, they stood. I thought that every word that the Bible uses, there's so much here, folks, that we're not covering everything. You know that, you know? You can always come back. If we were to come back through Exodus, we're gonna, we would find more things. But they stood at the nether part of the mount. Notice that in the tabernacle, there were no chairs. There were no sofas. There were no lazy boys. You couldn't sit down because it was, it was a continuous thing. You always have to do work. There was no chair there. Uh, the only chair there was was in the, the what is called the mercy seat on top of the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't for people. It was for God. That was his mercy seat. That's where he, where he sat. But there's no chair. Why is that? Because the work would not be done. The law is just rituals. They're pictures. They're shadows. And this is why if you hold on to those shadows, and people do, I know there's Seventh-day Adventists that hold on to shadows. They're not the real thing. They're only pictures. Um, look at what the Lord says in Hebrews 10 and 12. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. This is Jesus. Once he offered himself as a sacrifice, he sat down. 
this is the real thing. It's done. And that's what he said on the cross. It is finished. Amen. You'll never have to do it again. So that's why there were no chairs in the tabernacle, because it was a picture. A picture. That, and these people held on to the, to the idea of the, of the, of the shadows. And Mount Sinai, Mount Sinai was altogether on smoke, on a smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire, and the smoke thereof ascended as a smoke of a furnace. And the whole mountain quaked greatly. And when the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder, Moses spake, and God answered him by a voice. Notice here, Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke because the Lord descended upon it. And notice how he mentioned it, mentions it three times in a row, smoke, smoke, smoke. And that's a picture of being angry. That's anger. Thick black smoke coming out of that mountain. Um, that's to make these people, because Moses later will tell us, God wants you to be respectful of him. Don't play with him. Um, this is a very serious thing. Holiness is a very serious thing. And when the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder, Moses spake, and God answered him by a voice. So it was, I think it was like a siren, very loud and piercing. I hate that sound, and so do dogs, I think. When, uh, when we hear in the neighborhood, when we see a fire truck or a, a, an ambulance come by, that's to get your attention. And that is what the Lord is doing here. He's getting their attention. It, must, it was so loud. And the people, uh, the mountain quaked. And when the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder, Moses spake, and God answered him by a, by a voice. So all this is going on, and uh, it must have been a sight to have, to have seen this. And the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mount, and the Lord called Moses up to, to the top of the mount, and Moses went up. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go down, charge the people, lest they break through unto the Lord to gaze, and many of them perish. And so, notice how the Lord stressed in this. You cannot get to the Lord. You, you can't even see them. See him. I mean, it's covered with a dark cloud. Um, so he's protecting that. Moses at one point says, Lord, I want to see you. And... And the Lord says, I'll pass by you, and I, you can see my hinder parts. I'll put my hand over you, and then when I'll pass by you. And, and that's something. I mean, when we get there, we'll cover that, but that, uh, just, just to see what that meant. But here, charge the people. Tell them again they, that they bring not to, to see. I'm sure, like all of us, we want to see what God is like. What is he like? Well, don't let them cl come close uh, to see. And yet... We find this, this is where, you know, when you, when you first read this story in the, in, in the Old Testament, you find out, why was this, this is where this thinking comes from. Manoah said unto his wife, we shall surely die because we have seen God. And this was where, uh, this couple that had no babies, um, Manoah, she had, he had a wife, and, and that's, uh, when she was by herself, an angel came to her and says, that you can have a baby. And so she went and told Manoah, her, her, her husband, says, this man just told me I'm going to have a baby. And the guy says, where's the man? Let me see this man. So they run and find the angel. He didn't know it was an angel. And uh, he says, well, let me entertain you. Let me get some food for you. And so on, such as they did in the olden days. Uh, and so they offer food to him, and he just takes the staff and the food, the broth, and the food that they brought to him, and he just touched it with his staff, and it just burnt up. And he went up in the fire. And Manoah says, oh, good grief, we just saw God, and we're going to die. And this is, this is amazing. It's amazing because the, the wife says, uh, why would he say we're having a baby if he was going to kill us? And he must have thought, oh, yeah, right? It just goes to prove women are smarter than guys, especially in this story. You know, it's just, why would the Lord tell us all these things, how to, how to deal with a baby and all this, what about diapers and so on, if he was going to kill us? It's an amazing little story, cute little story. But um, this is where they had the idea. You could not see God. 
You know, you can see it throughout the, 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 the Bible from, this, from the mount. You'll die if you see him. And let the priests also which come near to the Lord sanctify themselves, lest the Lord break forth upon them. And Moses said unto the Lord, The people cannot come up to the mount Sinai, for thou chargest this, saying, Set bounds up about the mount and sanctified it. So notice they have priests, and we know that the priest are, the priest was not going to come into being until Aaron gets anointed. The priesthood, the real priesthood. But I believe this is the firstborn or the elders up to, to this point. And they're, they're uh, um, mentioned as being priests. So God says, don't even let them, the people that they go to God, even they can't come to God. Nobody can. He, the only one, he's, God's only authorized in Moses and later Aaron. Um, and, and Moses says, Lord, you've already told us not to come near. We, you already told us to set bounds about, about the mount and sanctify it. Um, and look what the Lord says. And the Lord said unto him, Away, get thee down, and thou shalt come up, thou and Aaron with thee. But let not the priests and the people break through to come unto the Lord, lest he break forth upon them. So Moses went down unto the people and spake unto them. It's not, here's the Lord telling us, this is a rebellious, stiff, naked people. Already he's, he's shown us that this is not going to work. You're, you're saying you're going to keep the law. They already said we're going to keep the law. And God is showing us here that because we know that as soon as they come down with the Ten Commandments, they're going to break them. And it's a picture of us. We need the Lord. Um, thou and Aaron. Aaron is the only one that can come up. And, uh, of course, Aaron is a picture of, of Jesus. But let not the priest and the people break through to come up to the Lord. Don't let them come up, because they will die. So Moses spake unto them. Here he is being a mediator unto these people. Uh, the law cannot bring you to God. This is what it all shows. It cannot show you God. It can only give you the law. It can only teach you. And we've been covering this. Because Galatians 3.24 says, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith, an instructor. So, but the law cannot bring you himself. Now, we're about to get into the Ten Commandments. What are the, the law is there to expose sin. That's what they were given. Um, Wherefore then serveth the law. It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. And is given to offer a solution. And this is the beauty of the law. When you see the law, if you say, these people saw God and they were so wicked, I don't stand a chance. I definitely don't stand a chance. And this is, the, this is when, how you fall in love with God. God says, you don't need to go their route. They were dummies. You can come another route. And so that's, yeah, that's throughout the Bible. He offers you this to, so you can see a solution. Um, the solution is being offered here in 324 in Galatians. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith, not by works, but by faith. And it's also to restrain the effects of sin. And notice, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost the savor, wherewith shall it be salted? So we that know the law, that we, we and I can picture, folks, so the Bible says one day he's going to take us out. And when he takes us out, can you imagine the chaos that's going to break out upon this earth? You would not want to be here. Already we see every once in a while, like these kids, they were just uh, protesting. They went through a, a Walmart recently, this just shortly, and they tear it up. That's lawlessness. Can you imagine what, is, what the earth would be like without Christians already? Uh, I can recall back in the late 60s as a kid, and when there was uh, riots in Detroit, and they were burning down their own neighborhoods. And you thought, people without the law, people get crazy. Just go crazy. And I can, this is, 
The Lord gave the law to restrain the effects of sin. We're, it's a broken down world. And so the law does a work right now. It's working. The law is working. But you take, it, you take the people that enforce it. And we know our government, how bad it's gotten in the past two years or so. To establish order. Now, <clears throat> look at this. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. Amen. So God has given the law to even the, the secular governments. They have it for this person. And now look at this, folks. Washington, in there, I was in there, I think, in 2007. I went in, inside the, the, the Capitol. And you'll see this. Uh, those, see those squares up on top and with the round um, uh, plates on, on, on it, they're up on the, by the ceiling. Those round plates are, are, are reliefs. They're bas reliefs, which means they're, they're not in the round. They're reliefs or, or, or sculpts of uh, lawgivers. All the lawgivers in the world, great, um, Hammerat, uh, Hammurabi, uh, uh, Napoleon, uh, the various lawgivers, but look at this. Down here on the north side, on the north side, which is the north side is the picture of where God lives, is Moses. Right in the center of all these lawgivers. All these are the lawgivers around that uh, um, building. And these are, notice how they're all pointing, they're all sideways, but when you get to Moses, Moses is right at you, you know? That is Moses. And so the law, we are a Christian country. I mean, a nation. Uh, Obama was wrong to say that we were not. I mean, and he's probably right. We were and we're becoming less. So he was wrong and right at the same time. Um, because this um, is Moses, and he sits right up front and center. And that's the law of God. You know, we, this country operates by the law of God. And we can only operate as long as we hold on to the truth and the laws. But they're being torn right now. Even, even right now, they're being torn down. And so there's a day coming when we're going into a one world government. And that's, this is going to be done away with. So it's to establish order. But notice that what happens now, folks... This is what the Bible says, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners. So that's not, the Ten Commandments is not for us, although we obey the Ten Commandments. We obey the Ten Commandments and we hold them as true, the true word of God, but they're not for us anymore. So what, what use are the Ten Commandments for us? Now, they're to establish principles because we now see the Ten Commandments through grace. We're not under the law. So there's still, we don't dis do away with them. Because there's still the Ten Commandments of God. And that's His mind. That's His holiness. So they're to establish principles of godliness to the converted mind. So they're principles. Now, and God spake all these words saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. So notice before he give this, gives the Ten Commandments, he introduces himself, I am the Lord thy God, your God, uh, and which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. He says, this is, how, he, he establishes who he is and what he's done. And what he's about to do to give you the law, the rules, which will govern our lives. And folks, it's amazing because I think when I mean when I was looking at this, I says, "Yeah, he's my God." And I remember he says, "I brought you out of out of out of, the, out, of out of Egypt, out of the land of bondage." And folks, I can remember back to '77. I mean, that summer when Star Wars came out, I went to see Star Wars as a non-Christian. You know, and then that fall, uh, things will change. And it's amazing to, to think back and say, 
what a wonderful thing, you know, what a fantastic thing. Um, he's my God. He, he got me out. He says, I got you out. I have every right to do this, you know, out of the house of bondage. I took you out. And you're going to see that phrase come out in, in Exodus, in Leviticus, in Deuteronomy, I think, over and over, out of the house of bondage, to remind us he has a right. He is king. Therefore, he says, I'm going to give you these rules because I own you. You're mine. I have every right. So we get, um, so God reveals his heart. This is his law. This is his holiness. This is a picture of his holiness. Um, we're going to look at how he feels and thinks. This is what you see in the Ten Commandments, how he feels about these things. Um, he showeth his word unto Jacob, his statutes and his judgments unto Israel. He hath not dealt so with any nation. As for his judgments, they have not known them. Praise ye the Lord. Now, we who are in this room right now, it's amazing that we look at the Bible and we find value in it because before... I mean, I was given a Bible when I went in the military, a little bitty Bible, a Gideon's Bible, the New Testament. I never read it, but I always protected it. Like it's going to do me any good if I don't read it. But, you know, that's, that's ritual, you know, because they tell you that's the word of God. They gave it to me with a bar of soap and toothpaste and uh, some shoelaces and a, a, thread, a thread and needle, you know, that little kit that they give you. Uh, and a little green little Gideon Bible, and I put my name on there, my social security number. And I stashed it, and I never read it. I says, dummy, I'm so glad the Lord forgave me for that. This is, and, and then later I read it, but I, I believe I still have it. It's valuable to me. You know, that was the first Bible I ever had. But we know he showeth his word unto Jacob, and his statutes and his judgments to Israel, his people. He shows you the, his Bible. He shows it to you. And if you, if you get value out of it when you read it, it's because he's doing that for you. You know, that's why. You are my witnesses, says the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. This is what he says. Therefore, the first commandment says, thou shalt have no other God before me. And so we're going to be planted... These first three commandments, now there's four commandments that are form the relationship. God gives us four, the first four commandments deal with the relationship towards him. And then the last six commandments in a, it deals with the relationship towards each other. Okay, so you have the first commandment and that is God, the father, his essence. This is. Um, father, a man in relationship to his natural child or children, an important figure in the origin and early history of some. And I'm thinking all these people that are out there that are trying to make the Bible uh, uh, neuter, pronoun neuter, where you want to take all the men and he's and that out of the Bible says, how, how crazy are they? They're crazy. They're shooting themselves in the a, in a foot uh, because he is the father. Uh, and look at the, look at his uh, um, his attributes. These are just some folks. He's immutable. That means he does not change. He doesn't get old. He doesn't uh, suddenly come upon new information. He knows it all. I mean, he's immutable. He doesn't change. He's omnip omnipotent. That means he's all powerful. There's nobody else you can go to that can overpower him. He he is it. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere, like Psalm 139 says. Anywhere you go, you'll find him. He's, he's omniscient. That means he knows everything. And he's self-existent. He's always existed. And the, my brain cannot understand that. So, but this is our God. This is he. This is the great I am. And there's many more attributes. And Jesus says unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. There is no other God. This is the only way. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above or that is in earth beneath or that is in the waters under the earth. This is the second. Now these are uh, foundation stones. These first 
four, that's what they form. And hopefully we'll, we'll cover just those and uh, we'll deal with the six. Hopefully we can cover that. Uh, God's image, God's, God the Son, you have God the Father, and you have God's image that is found in God the Son. Fools, Romans 1 says, Fools have changed the glory of the incorruptible God unto an image made like unto corruptible man, and to birds, and to full-footed beasts, and creeping things. You shouldn't do that because there's nothing out there. God is a spirit, that's what we're told. Um, <coughs> thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them, for the Lord thy God am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. God is a spirit. That's why you cannot have these things to... In fact, when I first became a Christian, I started wearing a, a, a leather strap with a cross and the five barley loaves and the fishes. That's what was on the cross. And after a while, I says, I was paying too much attention to it, you know. And I was jogging, so it would always hit me. I says, you know, I'm going to have to go. And then uh, there was a reason why. Because there should be nothing, nothing. And I love how even here in this church, we don't even have a cross up on the, on the stage, you know, that is great, because that's death anyway. Uh, but we, we love it, but we don't worship it, you know, because there's no image. He's a spirit, and that's what he wants us uh, to know. Jesus said unto him, I have been, have I been so long with you, and has thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me has seen the Father. He's the image. He's the, uh, the great, image. Man. Jesus, if you want an image, that's where you're going to find it. Um, the expressed image, and Hebrews tells us. Wow. And thou shalt take the name of the Lord thy God. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. So here you have the three cornerstones. It forms a triangle um, of the base. God's express, um, expression of his name, God the Holy Spirit. So you have here, this is what God says. When, when Moses wanted to, know, uh, wanted to know more of, of his name, the Lord says, And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, the, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness, and truth. This is his name. His name stands for his character. This is what you have. So you wouldn't take lightly these things, merciful, graciousness, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth. This is what you do when you make light of his name. You do this to his name. That's what his name stands for. So you should not. Finally, um, we're going to stop here, but let me just show you what this forms. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it shalt thou not do any work, nor thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy man manservant, nor thy maidservant. This forms the base, folks, of us Christians. This is the foundation of the Christian life. And this is our rest. So we rest upon this concerning our God. He is a triune God, and he has done all the work, and we rest upon that. I rest. I mean, everything is done. I, was, I spent so much time with kids over there in camp telling them, it's all been done. All you got to do is say thank you. It's all been done. So we rest upon that. Um, we'll start to pick up there and go more into that um, commandment. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for your kindness and goodness towards us. Thank you for your holy word, O oh Lord. And thank you for revealing your heart to us through thy commandments, Lord, of what you think concerning these things, how we deal with each other and how we deal with you. We, we pray and give you the glory and the honor through your son's name, Jesus Christ, for beside you there is another God. Thank you, Lord. And we love you, sir. Amen. Amen. Amen.